Joe Scheidler and the Pro-Life Action League continue to provide a forum for individuals who were formerly associated with the abortion industry throughout the country. Some of these women were actively involved in Planned Parenthood and the National Organization for Women. Some were administrators of abortion clinics. The conditions they describe in the abortion industry would not be tolerated in any other segment of medical practice. As you are about to hear in this expose, criminal negligence resulting in both physical harm and death to women patients of so-called safe, legal abortion clinics is not hard to find. Abortion allegedly frees women. This is one of the greatest lies of the feminist agenda, that to be free, to be women, we must be carbon copy men, we must be wombless. That killing children means saving them, and that women are safer, more autonomous, and better able to care for themselves in a dangerous world if they bear no children. Fourteen years ago, I was offered a job in an abortion clinic in Birmingham, Alabama. I thought about the offer and I thought it was really great that I would be helping women, that I would be fighting for a very good cause. So I accepted the job. A very short time after working there, I realized one thing, we were not there to help women. We were a business, a money-making organization. I came into a company that was very well established. This particular company is one of the largest in the nation. It does operate abortion clinics to this day, 12 clinics across the United States. When I came into this industry, I was asked during my initial interview, are you pro-choice? Well, of course I said yes, even though I really hadn't thought much about it. The next question I was asked is, can you handle the fact that this is a business? And of course, I fit right in. I have a business background. I have a medical background as well. There was no mistaking the fact that uh, I was here to make them money. No one ever said to me, I hope you're pro-choice because we want you to help these women. I never felt that. The conditions in the clinic that I worked at was very, very poor. We had no life support systems. Our people were not very well trained. Most of them were not even, they didn't even have a medical background. The doctors rotated in and out. We never had the same doctor. I met a doctor there at the clinic. His name was Tommy Tucker. And he came up to me one day and he said that he wanted to open his own clinic. He said he wanted to do things right. He wanted to have the best equipment possible. He wanted to have highly trained and qualified people working at the clinic. He wanted to do general anesthesia and have anesthetist come in and put these women to sleep so they wouldn't suffer. Because in the clinic we worked at, they did suffer very much. Well, I had this noble cause that because I had worked in medicine and I was used to a sterile environment, that I could bring that knowledge into the abortion industry and I could really begin to try to turn that clinic around so that we could give quality health care to women. I thought that was a wonderful idea and I accepted his offer and became the regional director of six abortion clinics in Mississippi and Alabama. We had the best equipment. We had highly trained, qualified people. We still lied to the women. That was something we had to do to make money. But we would only see a very few women a day because we didn't want to rush them through like cattle. We wanted to take time and give them the kind of medical attention that they needed. Well, that sounds real nice. The only problem is that after being in the industry, instead of me changing it, it changed me. I never, ever had a doctor in the five years I was there. I never had a doctor who did it because he believed it was the right of the woman. 
that was not first and foremost ever in his mind. I'm not saying that they don't exist, <laughs> but you certainly can't prove it by me or by my clinic. After just a few months, his greed took over. He wasn't making enough money. So the first thing to go was the anesthetist because they made a lot of money. And through just a few months of watching them put patients to sleep, we started putting patients to sleep ourselves. And we had no idea what we were doing. We just knew what we had seen them do, so we started doing it. Then our registered nurses that worked in our recovery room was the next people to go. And then our lab technician and on and on. The first thing I did was clean up the clinic, at least on the outside. But soon I realized that it was going to cut into my bottom line. Because you see, every time we bought a piece of equipment, we, like you, had absolutely no life support equipment. We had no crash cart. We didn't have any of those things in the clinic. And in the state of Georgia, which is where I'm from and where I operate this particular clinic, we were regulated by the state. But the state did not require that we have any life support, didn't require we have recovery room equipment, even though we did perform abortions under general anesthesia. It's an assembly line process. It doesn't require a lot of capital. Probably the most expensive machine he has there is that sonogram machine. Because you see, I was beginning to see things the way the abortionist sees things, which is the more abortions we perform, the more money I'm going to make. That was the bottom line. I started interviewing people that had no medical background at all, bringing them in to do the job of anesthetists, lab technicians, nurses, and even physicians. There was no medical background required for the job. You just had to be able to accept abortion. I have come to the realization that there is a great deal of diversity uh, among abortion clinics uh, in different states. My clinic in Falls Church, Virginia, we were primarily nurses. Uh, I was head nurse of the clinic. Uh, my entire staff were nurses or lab techs, uh, technicians. And we really didn't have any um, secular type of personnel outside of um, the secretarial work. Upon moving to Minnesota, uh, unfortunately, the freestanding clinics, what I have found is there are no medical personnel outside of the doctor who's performing the abortion. So I brought in people off the street with no medical background and trained them. We were seeing approximately 10 women a day in the clinics. But that wasn't enough. We started seeing as many as we could get in every clinic. But then he, there was no airline fast enough or efficient enough that could get him to all of these clinics. So he trained me to be a physician. I never spent the first day in medical school. I was just an ultrasound technician. I had a, a business background, but I really knew nothing about medicine, other than what, for years, I had seen other doctors do. But I started doing abortions. I started actually performing surgery on women. I did norplants, cryosurgery, pap smears, pelvic exams. Anything he did, I did. And I was real proud of that because I felt I did it better than he did. All of the employees would say, oh, you need to see Dr. Davis today because they felt that I was better than he was. I never had any problem patients. I never put a woman in the hospital. And he was putting him in the hospital almost every month in very critical condition hysterectomies, retained tissue. Everything that could go wrong with his patients did go wrong. 
It is difficult to work abortion for any length of time and continue to believe that it is a safe procedure. Even with the best doctors, abortion days are full of minor and sometimes major complications. I watched Dr. William Peard perforate a woman's uterus and then lie about the severity of the perforation. Out of all the women I worked with, several of those, I say at least half of them had had abortions and had repeat abortions. And yet they wouldn't let any of these guys touch them with a 10-foot pole. Never. And yet every day they told these other women, they're wonderful doctors, they won't hurt you, they're the best at what they do, he's really a nice man. And uh, sometimes the women would ask, well, have you ever had an abortion? And of course they wouldn't say, yes, but not by him. <laughs> So I really had a big head. I thought I was great because I didn't have those problems. I took my time and I gave all this love to those patients. So they really loved me. But the truth is, I wasn't giving those patients love. I was risking their life very negligently. Out of the thousands and thousands of patients we've seen, I couldn't remember one name or a face because they were just a number to me. I would refer to them by how much money they paid. Oh, that's a $400 case. Oh, that's a $5,000 case. But I didn't see them as people, just a number. I began to see these women. I never saw them as women. If you want to know the truth, I never saw them as women. To me, if they were so stupid that they would come in and believe our lies, they deserved exactly what we were going to give them. And that's exactly the way I treated each and every woman. I, ha I have to admit, though, I didn't really have much sympathy for them. And my, my view was, well, you got yourself into this position. You better tough it out. Then one day, a young girl came to us for a late second trimester abortion. You see, we terminated pregnancies all the way up to term. He came in and did her abortion. I monitored on ultrasound while he was doing the abortion. And as soon as he was through, he walked out of the room. She was still under general anesthesia that a non-qualified person had put her to sleep. But in our clinics, our doctors, those were not their patients. That's common around the country. These doctors don't care about their patients. We could see a separation, the OBGYNs that worked in their own private practice, and then they'd come to our clinic. If one of our patients had a problem afterward, they called me. That's common. I like Joy. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not trained to evaluate a woman's problems, post-operative hemorrhaging, etc. I have no skills that enable me to make that diagnosis and to pr prescribe a method of treatment, but that was required of me, and I did it for three years. When they called me after hours and said, I'm hemorrhaging, what do I do? That was my problem, not the doctor's. I was the person on call. I was the one who called in all the drugs. I was the one who prescribed the medication. I took her to the back recovery room. I stayed with her and did everything I could do to stabilize her. But she started bleeding. She was bleeding a lot and I couldn't stop it 